Hello and welcome to the Cyberden, your weekly dose of tech and games. You're currently listening to a special double interview with none other than Andrew Holschult, one from 2015 and the other from 2019. Thanks for coming, mate. Thanks for having me. Now, Andrew, please tell everyone listening what inspired you to enter the world of music composition. Okay, if we go all the way back to what first got me into music, uh, it's kind of a weird one because, honestly, I grew up on uh, pretty much gangster rap. <laughs> like the uh, the Tupacs, the Biggies, the Jay-Zs, that kind of stuff. That's really what first got me into music, and that was from my brother who really, really loved that stuff. He got introduced to it. Um, we both got introduced to it in a young age in the early 90s, and that was right when all that stuff was going on between Biggie and Tupac, and they were like the biggest things in the world. But um, as I got a little bit older, I started developing a taste for more aggressive music. I was kind of a little bit more of an outcast at, at you know at school. I wasn't like I was I was the gaming geek kid, you know. <laughs> so it was always like, all right, well, you know, after school, I'm gonna go home and play Duke Nukem 3D on my PC. It's like, why don't you play it on a Nintendo? It's like it's not out yet, man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I was I was a little bit of an outcast in that in that sense, and I couldn't find really a way to express myself other than you know going home playing some video games but i i kind of started getting introduced to more and more aggressive music from the few friends that i had bands like corn um metallica mudvayne at the very very early stuff with them and that kind of that all started hitting kind of a, a note with me because I just I had a lot of frustration and I couldn't I had no outlet for it. I mean, I could sit there with a game and play it all day, but I, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to have a voice with something. So that spoke to me on a different level and um I went on to get a guitar and kind of learn how to play that cuz I was like, man, I want to I want to figure out what these guys are doing and how they're getting those sounds because that's that strikes a chord with me. So that's kind of where I started with everything, you know. Are there any artists that have inspired you? I'll catch a lot of flack for this one, but a lot of my like influences are, um, it goes back to the people that you would normally go, oh yeah, well, they're great, obviously, but um, I, I really like listening to compositions from Hans Zimmer. <laughs> like, it's just, somebody said it right whenever they, they were like, yeah, he made, he made orchestras cool again, he made compositions cool again for music. It's like, yeah, you know, that sounds a little stock, because he does he does one thing and he does it really well which is makes like the big epic stuff. But the, again, it's more aggressive and it's got a big build up. So that's, that struck a tune with me. The other stuff that I would say, uh, Trent Reznor is a really, really big one of mine. He's amazing with almost everything that he does. You know, everybody falls sometimes and doesn't make the greatest things, but just about everything that he's done is pretty much spot on whenever it comes to production and you know, what he's trying to convey and get out and like, Old school thrash really speaks to me as well. Slayer, uh, Metallica, Megadeth, Anthrax, all that kind of stuff. It's all just one big, pretty much influence for me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it from one of those sources. And of course, there's, there's plenty more. I could go over a hundred here, but those are the ones that whenever I'm sitting down and I'm like, man, I, I need to think up something different. That I'll focus on one of those and go okay well maybe i can you know take a page here and you know write it my own way so that's kind of where those influences kind of started off from and it's still where i go back to where i'm not pulling pages out of their book but i'm i'm studying the book that they all wrote you know let's talk about your contributions to the top down shooter bombshell so what was the development process for each track like and what kind of direction were you going for with it the sound for bombshell was originally uh we wanted to do almost like a movie score when i was told that whenever fred brought that idea up i was like sweating pretty hard what he was saying was hey let's you know put together these big symphonic things and we'll have drones and we'll do this and that i mean like he didn't come out and say it like that but all the references that he showed me were exactly down that alley. And a lot of that stuff, you can't write it like I would have with the Rot soundtrack where it's like, okay, here, a verse of this, a verse of this, you know, a chorus. It's not formulaic. It's it's 
you build to a certain feel and uh, you just let it go wherever it goes. And if it sucks at the very end, you scrap it because it's not going to pass. That's not going to fly. So it was it was pretty much geared towards a movie soundtrack as far as that. And um, a lot of the influences came, honestly, I was listening to a lot of the Deus Ex soundtrack. There's a lot of moments on that where I'm like, man, that's that's beautiful. I would love to be able to do that. And um, I was kind of pulling pages back and forth from uh, the Hans, Hans Zimmer's uh, Man of Steel soundtrack as well. But there's also some some hints in there of some really, really heavy stuff like uh, Meshuggah-esque. It's not off time or anything like that, but it's it's tuned low and it's got a lot of low end to it. But yeah, that's that's as far as uh, what the sound more or less is, and I'm 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 really excited about it because I've never done anything like this before, and I got kind of the okay and the go ahead from both 3DR and Interceptor. They're like, hey, you know what? If you suck at it, we'll figure out something else. But we believe in you, and we think that you can do that. So. We're going to let you try that out and we're going to sit back and watch. And sure enough, when I got done with a couple tracks, I mean, I was not confident. Uh, I handed it to them and I was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know what direction I'm going. And I gave it to them. They're like, this is amazing. Keep building on this. So, you know, I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm pretty humble about, about it. And I'll, I'll take direction by all means when it's coming from me because it's always someone else's perspective. So I just, I ran with it and it, Turned out to be something really beautiful. So I'm really proud of that. Um, as far as the development process side of it, uh, the development process side of it was it was pretty simple and laid out. When we started, yes, it was like the whole movie soundtrack, but it, it got washed back and forth between, well, now we want you know the metal stuff to show up. And, and I, I would kind of fight back and forth between the guys. And I'd say, hey, look, we either do this one way or we do it the other. Because if you mix the two right now, it's it's going to be... It's not going to be good. It's it's just going to seem like a string of ideas that don't uh, gel. So there was a time when we were fighting a little bit back and forth on what certain things should sound like. Uh, for instance, this is crazy, but there was, I believe, and this is a number that I'm pulling up, but I'm pretty sure of it. There was 20 different versions of the actual theme before we came to a uh, a conclusion on what we wanted to do. Like there was the one with the original trailer that uh <laughs> I don't like to talk about anymore but it's still out there there's one with the original trailer and uh that one's cool but it's not the attitude that that bombshell came out to be and once I figured out at the very end of development what she was like like what we were working with you know I went back and actually did a lot of work at the very end and kind of retuned everything but yeah it was there was a lot of stuff back and forth um one of the biggest things, I think, honestly, was uh, the implementation of dynamic action tracks. Like, whenever some crazy stuff is going on, um, you know, a different piece of music will kick in. So one of the things that I would do with that was I'd study the the initial world track that we've got going on there. And I'd say, okay, what's a good way to accent this? And this is this is going back to uh, saying, you know, hey, we, were, we would kind of argue over what would, uh, what would work and what wouldn't which was uh, they, they wanted almost like a Mad Max-esque kind of feel for almost all of those. And I was like, no, 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 it can't be like that for all of them. You have to ramp it up to the game. It has to, it has to create a feel as you go through. So as you go through the game, the first, uh, the first world that you're in um, is mostly, mostly compositions just with like strings and some electronic stuff. So I wanted to do that, but I just wanted to make that more aggressive whenever those those moments came in. Whenever the uh whenever the crazy parts start happening and you're surrounded by enemies, I wanted those to kick in, but I didn't want it to feel like, you know, whoa, what just happened? You know, like just get kind of cheesy with like the the rock and metal stuff. Uh, I wanted to actually compose like, you know, a couple minutes worth of something and then throw it in to where it would be ramped up, but in almost and still in the same key, so it feels like the same song, so that whenever it fades back out it's all it's all good but yeah that's that's one of the things that was really cool it was also um an idea later on in development so it took some time and i was like oh man whenever the idea was thrown up uh because i knew i was gonna have to do a lot more music but it was totally worth it in the end uh fred's got some good direction and 
He has a vision for sure. He's got some ideas that uh, they don't look like they work sometimes. <laughs> but whenever you get to the end of the line with it, it's it's normally cool on the audio side. Like that's that's my experience with him on on the music side for sure. He's pushed me for quite some years, and I'm extremely thankful for that. But yeah, that's uh, that's some some little tidbits on the Bombshell soundtrack. You ended up remixing the covers of the Rise of the Triad 2013 soundtrack. How did that go down? The Rise of the Triad, uh, the remix, that soundtrack came out super late. And I wasn't, you know, super happy about it. But under the circumstances, I totally understood. Uh, Whenever it came down to the very end, and I'm like, finally, I get to put out, you know, I get to put out my baby. Thank God this is, you know, what got me first started in this. So let's do this. Dave Oshry got a hold of me, our marketing director on uh, Rise of the Triad, and he was like, hey, we should remix and uh, remaster all 30 of these. And I was like, jeez, dude, that is an undertaking. And we already had a date set up with Valve. Uh, I think we had two weeks. Um, yeah, so we had we had two weeks to actually put this stuff together and get the ball rolling. And he was like, hey, so are you in? And I, I, I said, hey, look, I need 24 hours to think about this, man, because I'm going to be honest, like that idea, the idea of that right now is stressing me out. I would love to go back and, and make these sound even better now that I've, I've learned a little bit more about the tools that I was using. And, you know, I wasn't super strained by the clock while figuring out how to use all this stuff and um, obviously apply it. That would be great. I pretty much took a day to myself and was like, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to do this? And it came down to the same question that always comes down where it's like, hey, how bad do you want this? And how bad are you willing to one day possibly become one of those top 10 guys? And, you know, I pigeonholed myself into that. And I was like, well, well, <laughs> all right, here we go. So I uh, I started remixing these and sending them over to, to uh, Dave and Terry, and they really liked them. But man, in two weeks, I went through 30 tracks and literally rebuilt all of the drum tracks, rebuilt all of the bass tracks, and rebuilt just about all the synth tracks. Right after I was done with that, I rebuilt the mastering section on it so that it wasn't too hot and it wasn't clipping or anything like that over all of them. And I did this in two weeks and I damn near lost my mind. <laughs> like, And this was right before QuakeCon where I'm supposed to go to a booth and talk about Bombshell and do all this stuff. And it was literally the night before, like, Fred got there. And we were all having a good time, just having some drinks in the Hilton Anatole. And he was like, okay. He was like, you you know, you're going to go back into the room. We're about to hit it. It's it's 10 o'clock. And I was like, I could go back to the house, man, and finish up the OST. And he's like, you're not done? I'm like, no, I, I've still got uh, one more track to finish up, and then we're done. So I went back and finished it up, and it was literally... Uh, three in the morning when I finished everything up, packaged it up, sent it over to Apogee for them to review it, said, this should be good. We should be fine. Just send it over to Valve and we're good. And uh, they did. And I literally didn't get to the hotel till about 4.30, passed out, woke up at 7 a.m., went down to the booth, and we started, you know, talking about Bombshell. That was the craziest couple days I can remember in a long time because I was so stressed out. Just I had to keep my composure the entire time. But yeah, as far as the Rot remixes, I put so much time into those. Oh my lord. But yeah, that's just a cool story I wanted to share real quick. On a personal note, what are some of your favorite video game soundtracks? And which songs that you've made happen to be some of your favorites? Okay, so some of my favorite soundtracks in gaming. Uh, obviously the Doom soundtrack uh like anything from doom or doom 2 even the expansion pack stuff was great as well um final doom and the plutonia experiment all that stuff was great bobby prince and lee jackson are awesome everybody knows it <laughs> uh the unreal tournament soundtrack was also a really really big one for me like that kind of that was honestly probably my first introduction to electronic music in general and um I remember thinking, I've what is this? I've never even heard this in a game before. This is this is awesome. And the more I played it, the more it grew on me. And man, like 
that soundtrack is burned into my head, especially uh, uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now, but the uh, the tune from uh, Facing Worlds, that level in general was like, whoa, <laughs> like, it's like, this is great. It's at- atmospheric. I'm in space. This track just works. But uh, the other tracks that I would say is uh, Quake, obviously, is a really good one because John Romero went to, uh, or Id, went to Trent Reznor and was like, hey, we don't really want, you know, songs. We want feelings more than anything else. We want, you know, to create an atmosphere. And he did that really well because that was, it was really good and terrifying at times. Gosh, Duke 3D, obviously, because it's, it's the first time I felt like in a game where there was an actual... uh, action soundtrack to a game i was like wow this is this is action movie music this is great i like some of the stuff from uh mortal kombat and mortal kombat 2 honestly those are really cool too those are great uh and you know you can't forget rise of the triad that goes without saying but <laughs> i'm gonna throw it out there as well rot was awesome but outside of that like uh I'm trying to think what's some of yours i'm curious over to me then. Well, definitely one of my favourite composers has to be Frank Lepaki, Command and Conquer soundtrack. His combination of uh, funk and heavy metal and ambience, it's just this great eclectic mix. I just love the first game soundtrack. Then there's also uh, Jesper Kidd of the Hitman series, absolutely fantastic soundtracks. Incredibly immersive listen, he's always willing to kind of add new spins to each entry in the franchise that he's composed for in the past. Yeah, yeah, he also like those first couple games, man. Those those that music was really weird for the time cuz it was like it was really strange. There was moments where it's like, "Wow, this is this music actually sounds psychotic." Especially in the second Hitman. Do you mean the Hitman Contract soundtrack? Yeah, you know, yeah, Contracts, I'm sorry. Yeah. Super dark. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of actually. Yes, you you hit the nail on the head on that one. <laughs> um as far as like, yeah, you hit the nail on the head on that, by the way. But uh, those are all awesome. But going back to the original question, I would say that like the um, one of my favorites to actually redo was from the the Doom soundtrack, and it was actually what locked in uh, post Rise of the Triad, where I was figuring out where like you know some like how my sound was going to sound as far as. Mixing drum kits and mixing guitars and bass and uh, and synths together and making it not sound uh, you know too cheesy, making it work was uh, for fun. Whenever I was doing the AD, uh, excuse me, IDKFA album uh, was uh, Dark Halls. That was awesome. That was a lot of fun. I had no idea what I was gonna do for that song, and I just went into it and I was like, you know what? If I had a guitar with a tremolo effect, that would be kind of cool. And I ran with it, and it was just, you know, for the purists that listened to that soundtrack, I was like, okay, the drum beat has to stay pretty close to the same, almost the entire song does, but it just needs to sound like it was created this year. Um, and by the time I was done with that, man, I still go back and listen to that, and I'm like, I can't I can't reproduce this. This is just, this is awesome. Like, <laughs> it's one of those moments where you're like, everything just worked, and... uh I wish this was on a triple A title release because this would be awesome. <laughs> but it was it was great. That was one of my favorite ones to do. And of course, uh, E1M1 was a good one, and that that one's gotten a lot of attention uh, from the Brutal Doom soundtrack, or I'm sorry, the Brutal Doom 2.0 release and uh, the IDKFA release as well. And uh, one more that I would pick out that was a lot of fun was uh, oh gosh, Quake 2 Quad Machine. You can't go wrong with that one. That's another good soundtrack. That soundtrack's awesome, though. Like, it, that's ridiculously good. But yeah, those are the ones I would say I'm, I enjoyed the most and I'm, I'm pretty proud of. Now it's time to move over to the 2019 interview. Let's cover now the retro-inspired shooters Dusk and Medieval. How did you get on board with these projects? Okay, so we'll, we'll start with Dusk. Uh, Dusk was essentially... Um, it was Dave Oshry who had hit me up, who is uh, the, uh, I guess, is essentially the CEO of New Blood. We worked together on Rise of the Triad because he was one of the lead investors for it. And he also did a lot of, uh, a lot of the producing on the game. Big majority of it, actually. He contacted me. We hadn't worked together in quite some time, probably uh, pretty much since Rot. 
And he said, hey, he's like, I've, I've got this game that I think that, that uh, your music style would be perfect for if you're interested. Do you want to check it out? And then, you know, he had me sign an NDA and uh, sent me a build of it. And then I immediately could tell right off the bat, I was like, man, this this feels really familiar. Uh, I couldn't, he didn't give me anything, didn't tell me anything going into it, but I just, I was like, that, that feels a lot like Quake, man. Like, that's, that's pretty interesting that the movements, it's, it's pretty close, but it feels just a tad enough different that it's a little bit more fun, like, as far as a, a modern shooter goes. And he was like, yeah, he's like, that's what, that's what got me hooked in too, was, was the movement. And so, um, he introduced me to David Szymanski, uh, who is building the game pretty much by himself. And uh, we talked quite a bit just about, um, you know, hey, do you want do you want your own soundtrack? Is that something that you'd be interested in? You know, do you want to pay for this? Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, he, at first he was like, oh, he's like, I, I really want to do everything myself. And I was I was I was OK with that. I was like, you know what? It's it's totally it's your baby. No biggie. But uh, I was a little tiny bit adamant because I I, I had an idea for what I wanted to do with this and I kind of just really wanted to see it through. So I went as far as to take the uh, the demo level that they made and actually make uh, basically how we have everything set up an ambient and an action track and some some transitional cues to it. And looking back on it they're terrible and I would have said no to myself. <laughs> but uh he David was like, yeah, hey, you know what? Let's let's give it a try. And um, the first couple levels that we did came out really well. And I started getting a little bit more and a little bit more comfortable with with what I was getting into. And it started spiraling completely out of control and turned into something really really cool. But um, that's that's how I got into Dusk. That was the very beginning, and we'll we'll tell that whole story at some point. It's. It's a really lengthy one, and it hasn't been written completely yet. But there's a, there's a lot of weird twists and turns there. But that's that's how I got into it. Um, a medieval was uh, was actually uh, Leon and Simon, which are the two developers uh, working on this game, along with New Blood, uh, with uh, their company's called Indefatigable. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm terrible. <laughs> and. Um, they basically, I've worked with both of these guys since ROT 2013 as well. So ROT's kind of brought everybody together again. Leon and Simon and I have worked on, we worked on uh, all the stuff that Interceptor Entertainment did. And uh, a little bit post. And we would stay up super late at night and just kind of get on Skype and hang out while we were working. And we did that for years. And at one point they were like, you know what, I, we have these ideas and we really want to do this. We're getting kind of tired here and it feels a little sterile. Uh, so we're going to we're gonna start our own company and start making our own games. And, I, and they, the first thing they asked me, they were like, hey, are you on board? I was like, yeah, man, like we're, we're, we're really good friends. They're like, cool, we got the whole budget lined up and everything and uh, we've already got it cut out for you and... You just all you need to do is sign, and I was like, "Oh, okay, all right, right on." I'd actually watch them build this, of course, moving into it, like just all these preconceptual alphas and everything of of what this game was going to be. And, and you know, at one point, all the enemies were just dots moving on a screen, representing a 3D person. And but you could still see the potential. I was like, "Whoa, this is crazy!" Uh, like the rock dudes coming out of the uh, <laughs> coming out of the wall. Dave's gonna kill me. For not using their regular, their real name, but uh, they they had all this stuff rigged up a long time ago, and it's crazy how much of it uh, has come together. And that's basically how I started on that. Was we we both were just like, hey, we want to we want to do our own thing. They wanted to start their own video game company. I wanted to see how many developers actually wanted to work with me outside of Interceptor Entertainment. So we we just started working together. <laughs> you know, it's the the two first companies to hire me are the two friends that I've known for a very long time, or three rather. But uh, yeah, that's that's how that started up. There's a lot of long nights in uh, in development, just uh, just going, man, we've got these ideas and we want to iterate on them. And I would just kind of add on as we were going. I'm like, you know, this would be cool. This would be cool. It's the same way with dust. But yeah, <laughs> that's how I started on this. 
So basically, the summarized version is, Hey, Andrew, do you want to compose for this game? Yeah, sure. Hey, do you want to compose... Do you, hey, do you want to compose for this game as well? Yeah, all right then. Pretty much. Hey, not a bad way to get into it. <laughs> Just keep yourself open, keep yourself available, you know. <laughs> now, Dusk is very Quake-like, but in my opinion, better. What are your thoughts? Quake is awesome, and it's like super near and dear to my heart, and there's no way that I'll ever sit here and be like, Dusk is better than Quake, because I'll get crucified. But... <laughs> Like, I, I, I like the new elements that it's brought to it. Like, like you know, the uh, no gimbal lock stuff. The um, Some of the making bunny hopping easier for players. I don't know if everybody's found that yet. But this is the first game that I could actually successfully continue to bunny hop and everything. And, yeah, it's 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 crazy. Like, uh, I don't know. Like, it, it does iterate on, on quite a few things to make it a little bit cooler as far as like some of the sounds and like you know triggering different stuff in the soundtrack rather than just having it rip off a cd but uh it definitely wears its inspiration on its sleeve so what were your intentions and aims with the dusk soundtrack what kind of direction were you going for okay so uh <laughs> um like i was saying earlier uh like at the very beginning it wasn't it was a little murky um uh, it's like, what do we want to do with this? Well, we want it to be synth-based. It started off as being, well, I'd, I'd like to kind of, if I remember correctly, it was, it was we kind of want to steer clear a little bit from the guitar realm and make it a little bit more, uh, you know, obviously Nine Inch Nails, early Quake kind of sound to it. And the further along that we got, the more I started feeling... A lot more comfortable with the sound that we'd made. In fact, the entire build of that first episode was really how I knew, okay, this is going to be okay and this is going to work and this, the soundtrack should translate to people because I was scared shitless that uh, it wasn't going to, nothing was going to translate. And it's just like, why did you guys hire this guy that's just making these guitars sound like utter crap? It's like, no, 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 you don't get it. Like, it's it's designed that way. If you go listen to older industrial albums, they're really in your face for a reason. They take up the entire frequency spectrum because it's supposed to sound ugly and it's supposed to be in your face and, you know, all this other stuff. But, um, like, it started off as, as really synth-based and uh, it started moving a little bit more and a little bit more into uh, situations in the game where I started kind of poking and prodding, kind of going, you know, these, uh, you know, something heavier might be more suited here. And um, David was really cool about everything. He's like, if that's what you feel like, man, he's like, just give it a try. And um, the first few that I did, he really, really liked. He's like, this is this will work out perfect. And after that, he's he pretty much hasn't. He hasn't had any real negative feedback at all from me, which is really nice. He just he's he's like, hey, you just do you. You know what you're doing. I'm not gonna guide you at all. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you what I want. I may throw an idea out there every now and then, but just let it be you. Which is what every artist ever wants to work with whenever they're working on a uh, a for hire piece of art. So it's been so awesome to get to that point to where it's just. Yeah, just do you. Oh, okay, no problem. Uh, that's pretty much where the where a lot of the inspiration started was Nine Inch Nails, and it just started evolving into stuff. There's there's obviously a lot of typo negative in there too in that first episode, and the second episode really it starts moving a little bit towards uh, like there's a little bit of Rammstein in there, and there's late two thousands Nine Inch Nails, but it all kind of sits in the same vein. It's supposed to be weird. It's supposed to be heavy at times. And it's supposed to make you feel uncomfortable, but still something that you can kind of jam to. So what equipment did you use for the Dusk soundtrack? And what tricks did you pull off to capture that eerie, unsettling feel of it all? So there's a lot of stuff on there. There's a, uh, there's a Roland SEO2 that's used for a lot of the sub synth sounds, which is um, Roland's Moog Model D clone, which Studio Electronics actually helped make for them. Recently, there's a uh, there's an addition to a, a with a Behringer Deep Mind, which is a a big synth that I've always wanted since I saw it come out. I was like, oh, this is super interesting. Look at this thing; you can just do all this sound design. It's crazy. 
So I started using that recently. Um, outside of that, I would do experimentations with synths. Like um, I had a Korg mini log at one point that I was taking out from the mini log and going into things like a uh, an MXR bass compressor, an MXR M80 bass distortion. I'm just looking over at the pedals right now. <laughs> uh, an Earthquaker Devices Arpenoid, a Fuzz Factory, an Earthquaker Bit Commander, gosh, uh, uh, Electromonic Synth 9. I mean, and I would put everything through a Moog filter. Like, there's a huge Moog filter that I bought about a year and a half ago, and it's arguably the coolest sounding filter ever. Like, every record you've ever heard where it does that thing where it takes all the highs out and then brings it back up, like, I guarantee you, nine times out of ten, that's been run through some kind of Moog filter. Unless it's a heavy metal album, they'd never do that. Uh, and outside of that, that entire chain, everything goes into a reverb unit, which is one of two reverbs. An Earthquaker Devices Transmitter version 2, or an Earthquaker Devices Afterneath. Um, both are really long reverbs, one's just a little bit more fucked up than the other. Uh... But yeah, like that whole pedal chain, I mean, like there's there's photos of it I'm sure you've seen on uh, my Twitter account and stuff like that where I'll take like a bass and I'll run it through a whammy pedal, which will just take it, you know, another octave down, which is dumb. And then just run it through all these pedals and get these crazy sounds with a volume pedal where I can swell it and it just sounds like something completely different. That's been the majority of Dusk is just... Running stuff through pedals, running synths into other synths, and using a lot of virtual instruments as well, like uh, Omnisphere, the entire complete collection. Jeez, um, I'm trying to think of what else. If I was in front of my work computer, I'd be able to tell you. But um, a lot of synth or a lot of string libraries as well, like East West. But um, yeah, that's been the majority of it. Is just running stuff through pedals and seeing what the outcome is and if it sucks throw it away if it's awesome keep going oh, oh there's one more one more there's one more thing that i have that's actually really cool i've never seen anybody else use it it's a company called electro faustus makes a thing called a drone thing and it's eight oscillators that are all just on like a big pedal box that you can turn on and off and you can tune them how you want and it's that's another thing that i think i actually used on uh Episode one for the the level for the cutty minds, I believe, for some of the uh, the lower stuff. So, how did the songwriting process go down for each track for Dusk? Uh, basically, open a session, and I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I, I just go into it. I don't even really think a whole lot about what I just made. I know that the sound of the song that I just made, and I know I need to complement it somehow, or make it fade somehow into this next piece, you know, properly. It can't just be two completely abstract ideas yet. I'll just open up a session after playing a level. He'll send me essentially a build of a level, David will. And um, I'll see what comes to mind and we'll run through it. And uh, I'll basically capture an entire piece of footage and then I'll drag and drop it into uh, to Studio One, the, uh, the software I'm using to record everything. And then I'll start writing things underneath it. And then once I find something that sticks, I'll just start building and not look at the footage. And then I'll go back to the footage and be like, is there any areas that have really high tension or that need some attention to detail as far as like showing off a new character? Or maybe there's a, a boss fight or maybe there's a huge group of enemies that you're going to be stuck around for a little bit that I feel like is significant enough that, you know, it, it requires its own separate track. And then I'll build something under that as well. And then we'll make like stingers and uh, and transitional cues so that everything just kind of works together. We're still working with uh, some of the limitations in engine from what we're doing, but uh, we're making it sound the best we can. But uh, that's that's pretty much the process for your, for each level. What would you say are some of your favorite tracks from Dusk? It's actually pretty easy. <laughs> I believe it is E1M8 or M9. It's the action track for that. But it's it's called uh, Unquenchable Anger. And it's the first time during the entire development of that game where 
once I was done, I was like, that's the sound. That's the sound I've been looking for this entire time. And I reused it quite a few times going back all the way over the entire ep- entire first episode and being like, okay, this action track needs to be here. We need this sound here. We need it there. We need it there. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, I'll send you a, a file that you can play um, after I get done talking about this. But uh, yeah, like it's, it's, it's totally 90s industrial perfect to me in my head <laughs> as, as to what matches with this game. And that, that's, that was the one that I was like, oh, there it is. Need to stick with that. Um, as far as uh, it being favorite, favorite, you know, like you can't pick your favorites, but I'd say that's the one that has the most meaning to me. Um, it's the one that shaped everything going forward, for sure. Now let's talk about a medieval. What kind of direction were you going for with that soundtrack? The direction given to me from when I started was, hey, look, you can do whatever you want with this. We trust you, but we'd really like to draw inspiration from uh, soundtracks that were done in uh, UX, which is like um, uh, Deus Ex was was one of them, Unreal. Uh, Those weird abstract soundtracks that are just too good like they're they're really really good <laughs> and um so what I, what i did was uh i went back and i actually played and finished for the first time don't burn my house down uh the the original deus ex i had never finished it beforehand i'd always gotten to a point been like i'll come back to this and then i never get to it um so i went and finished that i went back and played unreal unreal tournament and just kind of got a vibe for all these all these soundtracks and the other thing that I took to it that they they never mentioned was I I was like man you got a big sword and all these melee weapons dude this is freaking overpowered Skyrim so some of uh, some of Jeremy Soul's work too I I got pretty inspired I can't talk today pretty inspired from so it's it's a mixture a weird mixture in between Unreal <laughs> Skyrim and uh, and Deus Ex, all those soundtracks kind of is what I use for my inspirational funnel on that game. And I really like how abstract it's come out. I didn't think I could I could do anything like this. Now, people have made comparisons to Heretic and Hexen when they look at a medieval. But did you decide to go for a completely different approach with the music? Did you decide to uh, go for something that's original and fresh? Yeah, absolutely. Nail on the head right there. Um yeah, it looks like a it looks like Heretic Hexen, you know, or you know, it it's obviously drawing some inspiration from there, but we wanted to go a completely different way with with the music. Uh Leon is really 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 he's he's one of the lead developers on that. Leon is very in tune with with good music and I trusted him on a lot of the ideas that he was sending me for uh for a medieval and um, a lot of that was some of the UX music. He was like, you should really go back and listen to these. And he just sent me files back and forth. Now, as far as small Easter eggs and nods to Heretic and Hexen that are audible, yeah, you can hear that with the player. It wasn't completely intentional, but uh, there's definitely a laugh in the game whenever you pick up weapons That's <laughs> everybody's pretty much picked up on so far. Was the songwriting process for a medieval any different than Dusk, and what kind of equipment were you using this time? I actually didn't run very much stuff through uh, uh, through pedals for a medieval. I wanted to keep it as minimalist as possible, but um, keep it as abstract as possible. So it was, how many synths can you layer on this to where it sounds weird, but it doesn't sound terrible? So, like the Deep Mind synth recently, uh, Omnisphere and... Uh, Arturia's entire collection, the old, all the old school synth collection that they have, has actually played a giant, huge part in the medieval soundtrack. Uh, as far as the songwriting goes, the songwriting is really free. Um, it doesn't doesn't require too much thought into it. It's just find the you know Lee Jackson or Bobby Prince hook that you can run with. Find that first, and then you can add everything else on top of it. Once I find that, and it normally comes in the bass section, uh, then I'm good. I can add in all the weird stuff I want, and I can throw in weird timings if I really want to. I can make it wrap around. Um, 
yeah, it's it's just start with a, a simple melody and work your way out. So it's a little bit different. Uh, Dusk was very much a uh, an uphill battle for me personally, but a, med- a medieval's been uh, hey go ape shit, you know, <laughs> which has been awesome so far. So what would you say is the standout track from a medieval? Standout track from a medieval. I don't know if there is one that comes straight to mind because they're all so 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 cool. Uh, <laughs> that sounds so tooting my own horn with that. That's awful. <laughs> but uh, I'd say that the ones that you probably haven't heard yet, and I can't tell you what they are. They were actually made first whenever I was writing demos for this game, and we just haven't used them yet. Uh, they're for a special episode at the very last portion of the game. Now, Leon and Simon will tell you, this one has the best music, this episode right here, blah, 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 because it sounds like so-and-so, and Simon will be like, no, it's this one. Um, I think I think it's all, it's all really, really cool, and I think it's been an awesome experiment that's shown me, hey, you're not just limited to uh to writing a bunch of stuff with with uh guitar riffs and you know make it sound like Trent Reznor uh you can also absolutely work in the realm of ambient and still make it enjoyable which that's been really awesome for me to be able to see myself do that what were some of your biggest challenges that you faced while you were making these soundtracks <laughs> I'll get a little little personal here. Um, the number one toughest challenge was not uh, <laughs> not drinking every single day. <laughs> so let me back up a little bit here. A friend of mine, Robert Atkins, who uh, made some games way back in the uh, 90s all the way till about mid 2000s and is still working on some other stuff but under his company he he created sin and he also did some of the uh, the packs for uh for uh, the quake expansion packs i think it was quake 2 he was hanging out with me quite a bit back and forth right before i joined on the dusk and i was actually working with him on a project that he's uh he's working on but um they've since moved on I asked him before I got into Dusk, I was like, hey, um, what is, what's some pieces of advice you have? Because I know that you're, you're very, you're like best friends with Adrian Carmack. And he had uh, a lot to do, he had everything to do with the art for uh, a lot of the older id games. And he said, well, he's like, Quake, from what I remember, is mostly about a really, really dark place kind of in your own head. That's where the art direction was taken from. And, of course, a lot of Hellraiser movies, too, and references. Uh, but it's about finding that that thing in your own head and being able to turn around and basically shoot it in the face, but not having the courage to do so. And I was like, man, that's pretty deep. He, and the last thing he texted me before I, uh, before I started on that was, uh, hey, don't get lost. Uh, it's hard to find your way out. So uh, I thought about that for a little bit, and I'm pretty sure I knew what he meant. But um, I went ahead and started writing all this stuff for Dusk. And at first, I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to nail this. I'm not going to be able to nail this. And I started kind of drinking a little too much <laughs> during uh, long nights working, trying to just, you know, how do I get the inspiration for this? How do I get the inspiration for that? And... Um, I found that the more I boozed up, the more I could get lucid and the more I could get into that mindset of uh, essentially negativity. So that worked for a while. It worked for exactly one year and six months where it was just completely out of control. (laughs) Uh, So... Right up until about five months ago, I'd say five months ago, I was just completely like, oh my gosh, I have no idea how I'm going to finish this game. This is way too much work, and I feel completely stressed out. What am I going to do? Uh, so I just cleaned myself up. I've been like 99% sober since uh, January, and it's been like night and day. So I did find my way out, thank God, <laughs> and... 
I actually got inspiration again from doing that. So you could say that Dusk's development cycle <laughs> took a pretty big toll on me. <laughs> but that's probably been the biggest challenge for sure. But uh, I'm way, 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 way better for it. That's for sure. How many different versions of these songs do you actually make until you finally make a piece that you're happy with? Um, most of the time, it's um, just one song, start to finish. I just pick and choose really, really, really carefully. And um, sometimes there'll be extra demos. It, it's not a lot. And like in older games, I've had like moments where people have gone, you know, hey, this isn't really the direction we're looking for. Okay, let's try again. Okay, let's try again. Okay, let's try again. Like all the way up to like eight times. But um, if I, if it's just me and I'm just being hired because they just like my work, then I'm going to find an idea that I like that if I like it, I know that the client should like it and just work with it from start to finish. Now there's small, little, tiny details that get changed from version to version, and I'm talking minuscule. Normally it's in the Sonics, uh, but uh, most of the time it's just start to finish, man. Yeah, not a, not a whole lot of extra content that's unused, you know? Can we ever expect vinyl releases of either of these soundtracks, maybe for your other soundtracks as well? Yeah, that's that's been talked about quite a bit. There's a lot of information being thrown around from Dave, uh, who's the guy who pretty much calls all the shots for the most part, as far as the marketing side, about wanting to do a huge, uh, like, two or three LP Dusk vinyl as well, just because it's it's so much music. But I'm sure we'll do CDs as well. I don't see why not. Um, a Medieval will get its own treatment, I'm sure. But uh, I'm hoping all that stuff will be taken care of in the next, I don't know, two to three months. <laughs> we're we're kind of just doing this stuff ourselves, so we just got to watch out for each other. And, like, you know, if uh, somebody doesn't mention it, it's probably not going to get done. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll make sure to uh, mention it a hundred times, although he's been on the ball a lot about that. And he's initiated a lot of emails. So we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm like 99% sure that'll happen, though. Now let's talk about the prequel to Bombshell, Ion Fury, formerly known as Ion Maiden. You didn't compose the soundtrack, why so? At the time, I actually really wanted to. Um, I liked what I saw, and I saw a lot of potential with it, at the guys with, uh, at Void Point who made that. They're all super, super talented. And um, we were actually working at one point. I was working with them at one point. I did do two pieces of music. It was two demos, uh, you know, and just go back on what I said. <laughs> it was two demos for them that I made that I still have uh, that were originally supposed to be slated in that game. And I was going to start working with them and start helping them with sound assets. But uh, at the time, the company really needed me, the company being Interceptor, the, the company really needed me on, uh, on the Red Rogers project. And we were uh, getting really close to a lot of deadlines to where... Uh, there was enough work to where I didn't have time for both, and I just had to kind of go. Okay, I gotta bite the bullet. I gotta, I gotta help these guys with this, and I gotta focus here. So um, essentially, I was taken off of that one, and we we went and we finished Rad Rogers, which I love, by the way, and it came out pretty great. Like that was just another type of genre that I hadn't touched on yet. But yeah, man, how cool would that have been? Like, because Ion Maiden's really badass. Like, I I could be like the uh, the grandfather of the Holy Trinity. Uh, you know, like I did all the music for all three Ion Maiden, A Medieval and Dusk. It's like, oh, nobody else can wear that crown. <laughs> but yeah, like it's, it's, uh, I did a little bit. Now, I'm sure I'll release something someday, like later on down the road when we're all done here. But uh, the game's awesome. Everybody should go check that out. Any thoughts to share about the Ion Fury soundtrack? Mm, that's not going to happen right now. <laughs> Good old-fashioned legal ties. Now, back in 2018, Lee Jackson released a solo album, Calibrations, featuring music from Duke Nukem 3D, the 20th anniversary world tour, as well as a few original tracks as well. So what are your thoughts on this album? Yeah, I think it's really cool, and it's definitely right in the vein of the stuff that everybody loved from Lee back in the day. And if 
they're a fan of Lee's and they don't have it, they need to go grab it. Um, he was actually sending me preliminary mixes beforehand, like, hey, what do you think of this? And every time he sent me something, it was, it was, I was like, man, this is like getting in a time machine. This is so cool. Yeah, I really dig it. And I think that uh, he's able to build on a little bit of what he's best known for in a really, really colorful way. And it does nothing but compliment his sound. So yeah, I've already checked it out. It's pretty freaking sweet. I also heard you talk at the end. This is true. I actually start on the interview at the end of the album. I'll give you a bit of a story about it, actually. What was happening before the album was released? Lee started sending me these exclusive little tracks never heard before. I listened to them. I thought, yeah, they sound really good. He sent me one, which is supposed to be the Dope Fish theme, and it's called Fish Waltz, which is a reference to the song Fish Poker, which is actually the Dope Fish theme from Rise of the Triad Dark War. Now, what happened was, when I listened to it, I thought, okay, this sounds good, but it needs a burp, because that's what Dope Fish does. He eats and he burps at the camera. <laughs> anyway, good lord. Well, I'm going to get Joe Siegler for this one, but I don't know, he's had surgery. And I said, all right, Lee, hang on. I'll go sort that out for you. I rushed to the shop, grabbed a bottle of cherry cola, drank that, just started burping away into the microphone and said, hey, pick your favourite. <laughs> the funny thing is, technically, this is my first debut on an album. That's just by burping into a microphone. Everybody starts somewhere. <laughs> now on to the next Metallica record. <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. Uh, you, you can totally, you got that story for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, there's going to be one for the grandkids. When I'm old, I'm going to tell them, Do you want to hear the time when I start on a CD? <laughs> What's a CD? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> That's always my favorite is, at some point in in our lives, we're going to mention, yeah, I had that on CD, and somebody's going to look at you and go, What the fuck is a CD? <laughs> like That fucking blows my mind. <laughs> and now it's time for the final question. Oh, here we go. I know exactly what's coming. Yep, it's the one that everyone's been asking for for years. Andrew, will you please lend me your beard? Nah, I'm joking. <laughs> now, the actual question is, what's going on with the Doom 2 cover album? Uh, <laughs> no, there's, there's nothing to share right now. I've been completely swamped, and I'm still swamped. I have, like quite a few projects that I haven't even been able to talk about yet uh, that um, I'll be able to get into at a later date. But uh, yeah, nothing nothing just yet. Old Andrew needs to pay his bills, you know? <laughs> and plus, I really actually do want to go down to um, id and actually talk to somebody there about that and, you know, just kind of Ask him, hey, can I get your blessing on this? Rather than just kind of put something out like I did last time. I just don't want to step on anybody's toes. There are things that are done. <laughs> just not a lot. Andrew, it's been an absolute blast. Thank you so much for coming on board. Yeah, dude. Anytime, man. Thanks for having me. Is there anything that you'd like to say to your many fans and admirers out there? Um, go buy Dusk in a Medieval. <laughs> and thank you for listening. <laughs> And I would just like to thank my wonderful listeners out there for tuning in to another great interview right here on The Cyberden, your weekly dose of tech and games. Thanks for coming aboard, Andrew. See you later. See ya. Have a good one. Hey, this is video game composer Andrew Holschultz speaking. I'm responsible for the music behind Dusk, A Medieval, and many more. You're listening to Jake the Voice on The Cyberden. When I was recording the 2019 interview, I was actually interrupted outside by some drunken students yelling. And this is what we had to say about that. Um, sorry, I'm getting up. A bunch of drunken teenagers started yelling things out loud. I'm doing an interview! <laughs> get a job! I don't know, maybe, maybe, they're, maybe they're drinking in order to get inspiration for uh, composing music themselves, or perhaps. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> This gives me an idea for a song! <laughs> yeah, just wasted. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna keep this in the interview as a blooper at this rate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care, put it in the whole thing. <laughs> hey, this is video game composer Andrew Holschel speaking. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm very grateful that you keep buying my records. Hey, this is video game composer. <laughs> wow. Hey, this is video game composer Andrew Holschultz speaking with a public service announcement. 
Heartbreak is temporary, but doom is eternal.